Welcome back to the 2020 Kentucky Bourbon Festival, the virtual edition. We're here at Barstown Bourbon Company to talk about whiskey mingling tonight. And a lot of people like to talk about whiskey blending, but we're going to talk about why it's really mingling. And in, in the industry, people like to distinguish between the two. Am I fair in saying that? I believe you are, yes. The, the, these, these nodding men are buddies of mine from the distilling industry, and I'm so glad to have you here. John Hargrove, Chief Operating Officer here at Barstown Bourbon Company, and Brent Elliott, Master Distiller at Four Roses. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Well, tell us, tell us why. Let's, let's get past the ugly word of blending so bad. Why is it so? Jump in, anybody. <laughs> well, or or I am I making you, too much of it? it? It is a bad word, in particular for us because for many years we were a blended whiskey in the US. So if you know the history of Four Roses in the late 50s, we had been a straight bourbon whiskey for years. And in the late 50s, we were made export only as a straight bourbon whiskey. But the Four Roses name stayed in the US, but it was a blended whiskey. And so since our return in 2002, we've really tried to separate ourselves from that blended whiskey because that's very far, you know, it's a whiskey, it's a blended whiskey. For people that don't know, it's, they don't realize how far that is from a straight bourbon whiskey. Talk about that in particular. So it's blended with what? It's some bourbon spirits and, and grain wines spirits, you yeah. coloring. They're, they're, you can just dilute the good straight bourbon out by adding all these other fillers. <laughs> so um, Cost savers. Cost savers, exactly. And so there's a huge difference between a blended whiskey, if you're a straight bourbon guy, and straight bourbon whiskey. And because we were known as a blended whiskey for so long, we make a conscious effort, even though technically we're blending, we're taking straight bourbon whiskeys and blending them together, we try to stay away from that term. So we're mingling straight bourbon whiskeys together. Does that get your hackles up to hear blending? You're just blending, or does that bother you? It do doesn't have the stigma with to it? To the educated drinker and consumer, I don't think it bothers them too much. but that the past dictates what a blend uh, usually is. So I think that's why we refer to mingling instead of blending when you're in the industry. So you know you're talking about mingling straight bourbons together compared to additives, coloring, gray neutral spirits. So all that's uh, uh, left out of this part uh, of these products, uh, such as what you have in Discovery 2 in front of you right here. So Brent, speak specifically to Four Roses and its mingling program. I mean, you've got all these different recipes, different mash bills. I would think that somehow that adds to the complexity of what you're trying to do. It does. In some ways it makes it more difficult, but really I think it makes it easier to make it a consistent product because with straight bourbon whiskey, you know, there's so many regulations and guidelines that we have to follow. So even when we follow these guidelines, we can't control everything. Uh, we're at the mercy of the weather, the wood. There's so many variables that go into it. So it's impossible to make a consistent product, you know, barrel after barrel, year after year. And, but we understand the consumer wants consistency. So to maintain that consistency, we have that control by creating different recipes. Each Which one gives you more options? I yeah, guess, it does. To hit that flavor target? Yeah, so you know, all, if you go into our warehouses, you have 10 different recipes in the barrels that you know, it, we have at our disposal to pull from to mingle, and we have more control over that ending flavor profile. So we use it for consistency. That was historically why we did it. And now we also use it to create diversity and variety in our different products. And what just came to mind was the different standard bottles that you have. So talk about um, how each, how many recipes are in each and why it differs. Okay, well the Four Roses Bourbon, that's the one that's been around the longest. And that is really where the consistency started. And that's up to all 10 recipes. Um, in 2004, we came out with our single barrel, which by design is one barrel. So that's always one recipe. The, 100 proof is always the, our high rye mash bill with our V yeast strain. And then 2006, that's when we really started exploring that, the small batch platform. And that was going to the 10 recipes and pulling different combinations to create something just totally unique. And so the small batch for, in 06, that's four recipes. And then fast forward to 2019, we introduced the small batch select and that's six of the recipes. And it's complex and fun and Four roses, but with a little different accent. I yeah, think. That, that's the whole, that's what we're trying to do is not only create that product, but communicate you know, that versatility that we have by you know, creating those layers of flavor, creating that different kind of balance, that synergy with 
different flavors and aromas. So it's, you know, we use it for, to, for consistency and to create unique products. John, you guys are just, your, your mingling program is targeted to be different at every single stage of the game. I mean, it's wholly new products. Talk about that and why, and why maybe you set out to do that versus um, make a line extension. Right, so for us it was an evolution of a, a new company, right? So we opened our doors in September 2016. Our first age stock hits four years this month actually. So in the meantime, a lot of new startups put out gins, vodkas to generate cash flow. We decided to wait till the two, three year mark and then buy maturate stocks out there on the open market and blend with some of our younger bourbons that were produced here in 2016, 2017 now. Uh, to really get our product out there and introduce our brand, our bourbons, our whiskeys uh, to consumers out there in the market while our bourbons that will be 100% produced here will come out in 2023 uh, around a six year product. With that, we produce 47 mash bills this year between us and our collaborative distilling program with our internal needs. Um, so we got some fun stuff aging right now that we're experimenting with uh, to where we're looking at new product uh, extensions while we're continuing our fusion series, while we're continuing our discovery series. You'll see in fusion four, we're actually getting away from the previous mash bills in fusions one through three, and you'll see a couple new mash bills blended with some older stock of bulk bourbon that we purchased out there on the market. So Talk about do, something that, that you have right now in the market that somebody could say, I'm gonna grab a bottle of that, and yeah. I want John to tell me what is in there in terms of its mingling. So speaking, this is discovery number two right here. So we're in the process of blending discovery four. We have one through three out there on the market right now. So this really shows the art uh, of our blending capabilities here on site. We don't have a master blender. Um, we have a team. So that team consists of our culinary team, our distilling team, and our beverage team. Actually, it consists of about 15 people. And over, over about a month's period of time, is how we come up where numerous people can submit recipes. Um, they, they really uh, evaluate our aged inventories from our own internal stuff at two, three, four years to one of our seven recipes that we've bought out on the open market uh, across Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, uh, some maturate stocks, and we really let them go at it. And, and then we come together as a team and really develop what that final I, recipe is I'm really be. interested in the let them go at it part. Do you, do you have some really good vigorous discussion, shall we say? <laughs> Yes, uh, but everybody has uh, a different perspective, and I think that's why some of our first releases stand out so much, and we've seen such success with them, because we've came at it with a very transparent approach from the way we do it to what we label on the bottom with the exact percentage, our Fusion 3, 60% uh, actually is uh, three year above product produced here, uh, while the other 40% is a maturate stock that we have. So it's a great team to work with, um, and it comes down to blind objective tasting, and we get clear results each time through how we test and how we come up with a final product here. So. Isn't it great when things come together just right? Four Roses Small Batch brings together four of our 10 distinct bourbon recipes to achieve an award-winning bourbon with exceptional balance and a smoothness that's enjoyable neat on the rocks or is the foundation of a craft cocktail. Four Roses Small Batch, a perfectly balanced top shelf staple. Be mellow, be responsible. The first Napa Valley style destination on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail to combine distilling, culinary, and beverage experiences. The Bardstown Bourbon Company places the science and art of whiskey making front and center. Our blend of bourbon makers push the boundaries of innovation to produce the highest quality Kentucky bourbon, whiskey, and rye, while honoring the traditional craft of distilling for a modern, authentic bourbon experience. To learn more about our full line of products or schedule a tour, visit bardstownbourbon.com. I've been in your lab a couple times, and when it's, I guess it's set up for your tasting panel, and it's a forest of glasses. Uh -huh. And that seems complicated. I'm sure there's a lot of method to that madness. Is it hard to go through that, or, or is it something that you've done for so long that now it's kind of de rigueur? Well, it's, you do have to manage that. You have to know, depending on what we're evaluating, the best way to go about it, you know, to counteract you know, palate fatigue, or you know, it might be just figuring out how to store that data, all of that information we have, whether it's the distillate stage, four years, five years, 
Um, so there's a lot that goes on, but we have a system to know how to do it both, you know, to track that and a system for how to actually approach it, how to smell and taste individual samples. So it could be, for example, a single barrel. The liquid that ultimately ends up, or the barrels that end up in a single barrel product, they've been looked at at full strength at 20%, and they've gone through essentially two rounds of approvals before a batch is approved for single 20 barrel. 20% as in watered down to 40 proof? Exactly, uh-huh. And then once it gets to that stage, we know that batch is good. It's just a matter of approving individual barrels. So at that point, there's no more tasting at full strength, thankfully, because we go through a lot of single barrels. So at that point, it's just taking those individual batches, sampling each barrel, cutting them to 20%, and looking at them that way. And at that point, it's just aroma. We've got to draw a line somewhere. We couldn't be tasting and smelling everything or every single barrel that goes out um, at full strength. So we, we dilute those. And actually, it works. I know from experience, it works better. It's advantageous to look at it at 20% because when you dilute it like that, you can see more of the differences from barrel to barrel. And it's actually, you set them all up in a line and you go through and any that stand out are the rejects. Because we don't want, there's nothing that's going to be and with that. And typically the negatives you're looking for at that stage, right? Negatives. It's pretty much, the, 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 what's coming out of the barrel is good, you know that, but now uh -huh. it's really getting the finite, simple, bad parts and, and yeah, water it, does that? Yeah, if you cut it to 20%, you get to see, it's not how you want to enjoy your whiskey, but it helps you get a more objective view of all the different components that are in that whiskey. You're nodding, so I, I gather. Yeah, I totally agree with that. We do the same thing. Uh, even when we uh, judge distillate coming off the still, we cut it down to 40. It really dies down the volatility of the alcohol, and those barrel extractables, uh, those conjuner profiles really show at lower proofs. And um, things that you don't want also show at that lower proof. Not in a bad way, but you can say, all right, this maybe doesn't make our single barrel program, but can make our small batch. So you categorize those results based off uh, really reviewing on an organoleptic sensory standpoint at 40 proof uh, when you cut it down. So. so this is something I would imagine a lot of viewers don't know goes into it. Is, is this, does this take a chemistry background or is it just, can you be trained to be a really good part of a sensory panel to do that? I don't think there's any chemistry involved at that stage. I, I would chemistry agree with was that. done way on the yeah, other end. Yeah, this is more yeah. like cooking or enjoying something. Yeah, it, it's it's more just experience and enjoying it and knowing what you're looking for. And again, knowing how to like when I'm saying we dilute some, we don't dilute some. There's no real. I mean, we have some standards for that. But you kind of know when you're looking at a batch or a barrel how you need to evaluate it, and you can kind of approach each batch in its own way. And so once you're there and you've got the data on these barrels, and let's, let's say you are making uh, the small batch, you know there's going to be some barrels mingled. Do, do these lots have characteristics that you say, I think, John, you mentioned something similar, that these, this is going to the small batch. These might go to single barrels, and this may go to just a Four Roses bourbon as a whole. I mean, is it easy to quantify that? Um, yeah, and that's part of what we're doing, um, looking at, for example, maybe the O batches that will end up in small batch. At four years, we look at every batch that was produced you know, four years ago. We sample them at four years of age and we look at them all at the end of the year together. And so the O's that- You're just looking at all the data at the end oh, of no, the year, Oh no, we're looking right? at like evaluating each batch. Uh -huh. Not every barrel in each batch, yeah. but each batch that was produced four years prior. And at that point, like for example, the O batches, the ones that really have that O character that you know, is part of the small batch profile, those are the ones that will be assigned or you know, allocated for small batch. And it's also how we find batches that might be set aside for the private barrel program or limited editions. We're always looking for barrels like that that seem to be aging well and not becoming too oaky or too flat. So it's, it's really, um, a living activity. We're always changing and adapting how we do it, you know, from depending on what we're looking for or what the, the intention is for each evaluation. It just sounds like an, an extreme amount of data. Is it what you guys is, are doing as well? It ensures consistency. Uh, so Brent touched on all the variability uh, from aging, the atmospherics all outside, how that impacts the aging of the bourbon and the whiskey. Uh, so going through them, uh, doing conducting sensory, quantifying that sensory, looking at the data. Um, 
that ensures great small batches, great single barrel program, great straight bourbons. Um, so it all goes back to the team that you have at your distillery. Four Roses has a phenomenal team uh, that does a lot of that work. BBC's, uh, I think, assembled a, a great team here also that does that work. So it's just not one or two people. It's, uh, it takes a team to do all that. I mean, it's not sitting around with so, a bunch of beakers of this barrel, that barrel, I mean, like you do at home, you're farting around trying to do right. a mingling, right. trying to make your infinity bottle. Oh, no, so it tastes good. It's lined up, I'm sure. <laughs> Four Roses Lab, lot code, lot code, lot code. We quantify it after we sensory it, catalog it, and we know what to do with it when it's time to harvest it. Does that give you data to spring forward to the next year with some predictable, you know, model of predictability that says these barrels did this last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And you, and so you're not always starting at ground zero every time? Is that fair to say? I know what we've built here, and I think the whole industry is moving to a more uh, data-based collection strategy, how you harvest, how you mine that data, and then how you interpret that data. So uh, we have a, a program here called Ignition to where we upload all the metrics, basically from the incoming grain, HPLC, mass spec GC analysis of the distillate. So when you pull a barrel 10 years from now, you can go back all the way to the farmer and look at all the production key performance indicators across the board. And then the hard part is trying to identify um, all the different variables and how it influenced the bourbon. So here we're building that program as we speak. We're four years old. We do it through sensory, but we're trying to extrapolate that into data and then how that interprets to good bourbon right now. So you guys along the same lines, right? Uh, very similar. We, we look at all that data. We've actually the ignition we just started that system and you know I mentioned all the variables there's so much that goes into it that it's hard to just it's hard enough to wrap your head around it much less with just Excel sheets and chicken scratch so the more we can incorporate any of this new software these new you know data collection platforms the better we'll be because there are dots that can be connected that I'm sure aren't getting connected now just because there's so much going on behind the scenes of whiskey it's absolutely right that's why I said it's a work in progress we're not there yet but we're working to get there someday so. Now, now, feel free to point, uh, you know, the finger at me as being naive, but it seems to, to make the, what seems to be pleasant and fun work of mingling kind of dry and scientific. But it has to be that way because the end product has to be consistent for consumers like me. So I'll tell you, the human element will never go away from rating and um, categorizing bourbons. We just want to know the root cause of why it's good or why it can be bad to help us better and understand how we can improve the process. There's no machine out there that's going to beat Brent in sitting down and saying, all right, this one's for single barrel, this one's for small batch. That will never go away, I guarantee it, and I'm sure Brent thinks the same way. Well, uh, thankfully. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it can tell you what everything's in there down to parts per billion, but it can't tell you if it's good or not. So until it can do that, you know, we're going to keep our jobs, I guess. What, what's the fun <laughs> part? Is it when you do the special projects like the limited edition single barrels or, or when you're creating a new Infusion 5 when that comes out? Is that the fun part? What, what is it? The fun part here is just how new and how fast we're expanding. So when you say fun part, got a construction project, new bottling facility going on. We have three expressions coming out. We have a lineup in 2023 of four new expressions, uh, rye whiskey, two weeded bourbons, and a rye bourbon coming out in 2023. So, and the whole team's uh, leveraging this to work on this. So for me, it's getting the team together. It's going back and forth on these blends right now and discussing what we're gonna come out with the future on line extensions, so. How about you? What oh works? yeah, it's, everywhere you look, there's fun. I mean, the, the industry as a whole, the, our brand, all the other brands, it's an exciting time to be involved in bourbon, clearly. Uh, but specifically, you know, you mentioned the limited editions. That is fun. That's probably the most fun I have each year. Uh, for a few reasons, it's getting to go back and revisit these batches that you know I haven't looked at for a year. These you know, ten to twenty whatever year. And they're old not batches. tanked; they're still in the barrel. Yeah, they're still in the barrel. Wow! So it's pulling those old batches, <clears throat> revisiting them, getting you know reacquainted with how they've evolved in the last year, and then trying to bring them together to create something different from last year's and something unique. So that's always the most fun. So you guys throw a curve into a lot of these things with finished barrels, or fi finishing barrels, typically wine so far, I, be I believe, is what all you've indulged in, is right. that right? Right, and so breweries, uh, <clears throat> Armagnac House out of France, so. That's right, Brandy at Copper and Kings. Correct, we, we've done a few, and that really evolved from our collaborative distilling program. We were really wanted to work with other breweries, winemakers, distilleries, uh, Brandy, Armagnac, Cognac, uh, so we got a lot of different stuff right now aging uh, in the pipeline that'll come up under those finished categories. 
but in the spirit of collaboration, uh, we really wanted to partner with these other people that were really pushing the envelope on finishes. How we just didn't want to deal with a barrel broker. We wanted them to really tell that story of our master distiller, Steve Nally, working with a winemaker out of Napa, California, and coming up with one of our finished collaborative series products. So it's a story, it's a great product, limited time offering, and that's another really fun part of the process is coming out with those. Can you even track that input? Like the, you, you, you were alluding to the Pfeiffer Pavit release, which I thought was fantastic. Um, you don't know what you're getting out of that barrel until that thing shows up. How right. wet it is, how, how much time maybe that wine spent in there so, and influenced the barrel? It's a great question. We actually send a very specific set of instructions on the day of harvest. Um, so we t tell them to keep a roundabout dregs in there, keep it wet. Uh, put inert gas to evacuate the oxygen out of it so it doesn't spoil. We bung it, we seal it, they immediately put it in a reefer truck 55 degrees or below to control bacteria growth. Overnight it here and the day it comes off that truck we're filling it with bourbon. Uh, so we can really keep uh, that element that doesn't spoil and really keep the legs or whatever's in there to influence what we're putting really in. Really controlling the uncontrollable at that point. Correct. Player. Trying to at least. This industry. You guys ever get anything like that? Anything <laughs> fun? Uh, maybe, you know, right now or I'd say for the last five, ten years, we've just been trying to keep up with demand. So we haven't had a lot of room to innovate outside our ten recipes, which is fortunate for us that we've, uh -huh. we've had that. It's like our intrinsic ability to keep it exciting, to keep innovating within what we do by offering new expressions. But outside of that, we haven't really had any room to try any new mash bills or try any finishes. But all that's fascinating. Hopefully someday we, you know, someday soon we'll be able to start looking at going outside of what we're currently doing and playing around a little bit. And some exciting, we actually held that Piper Pavit was our first finished project. We held two barrels back, so our oldest barrels are 30, 37 months on the finished side oh my gosh. Uh, for, for that uh, experiment. So if that experiment's gonna get, do good or not, we'll see. That's the, another fun part about this um, industry is all the experimentation. You don't hit a home run every time, right? So uh, you really evaluate what's out there and then come up with a plan if it uh, doesn't turn out how you want it to. And then look back and say, why the hell did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully before the consumer says exactly. that, right? So. Gentlemen, thanks again for being with me for this discussion of mingling, which is far more complex than I had thought. John Hargrove, Bartstown Bourbon Company, thanks so much, man. Thank you for having me. Brent Elliott, Four Roses, always good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks, Steve. We've got a lot more episodes to follow at the Kentucky Bourbon Festival 2020 Virtual Edition. Sit with us, sip with us, and we'll see you shortly.